BJP leader Jagmeet Singh is facing many challenges in this election. He won the party leadership race back in October of 2017 after serving as the deputy leader of the Ontario New Democrats. But he only entered the House of Commons a year and a half later after a BC by-election back in February. Under his leadership, the party's fundraising and polling numbers deflated while the Greens' fortunes have grown. And in Quebec, he might face his greatest challenge. Home to the orange wave in 2011, many of the NDP's 14 seats are in jeopardy. In the middle of this election campaign, we met up with Jagmeet Singh at Nate's Deli in downtown Ottawa for coffee. Hi, Mr. Singh. Hi. It's so nice to have you here. I appreciate you making time. It's great to be here. Now, normally we do a power lunch, but this is a crazy and hectic time in your <laughs> schedule as well as every other leader's, so we're having a power breakfast yes. today. <laughs> uh, so normally I do ask you why, why you chose this place, but we ended up choosing it because right. we had to make sure that this uh, interview works I out. would have chosen a vegan spot. Right. Uh, the last power lunch I did was with one of your competitors, obviously, Elizabeth May. Uh, I had asked her who her personal hero was, and she had responded that it was Jesus Christ, and then right away apologized for saying so. And the reason she apologized, she said, was because she doesn't think that Canadian politicians should wear their religion on their sleeve. And that's not a knock at anyone specifically. She was speaking about herself. But I wonder what you think of that statement, the idea that politicians shouldn't wear their religion on their sleeves. I think that you should be who you are and like, be proud of who you are and put that out there. Like, I'm proud that I'm a, I'm a Sikh. I'm proud that I've got values that were inspired by my mom that teach me that we're all one, we're all connected. How, how foundational is your religion? I know you talk about some of the tenets of it, but how, like, how important is it to your daily life? Do you pray? Do you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, what, yeah. what is it like? For you? Yeah. Well, I meditate uh, regularly, mm -hmm. and the goal in meditation is to realize that we're all connected. Do you believe in God? So we believe in a connection between all things, and it's a connection that um, exists between you and I, mm -hmm. between all people, between the environment in me and us, uh, and that connection is what we focus in on and what I focus in on. I know you've already received a lot of questions on uh, Bill 21, speaking of religion. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you that there was a poll out of Leger yesterday, I want to get the exact numbers right. Uh, it shows that 64% of Quebecers support that secularism mm -hmm. law, 38% in the rest of Canada. What do those numbers tell you? Well, there's, there's some work to be done because uh, it's, to me, divisive and, and troubling that uh, laws that are designed to discriminate someone because of the way they look are supported by people. Uh, it means that, you know, what I've always known, there's, there's a lot of challenges. And those challenges mean trying to breaking some of the barriers that exist and maybe some of the myths or stereotypes that make people think that just because someone looks different that there is uh, a justification to then treat them differently. Do you think the support of Bill 21 is rooted in racism? Uh, I think that there's, it's hard to figure out what the, the root is. I don't know exactly what it is. I just know it's something that I Do you have a gut feeling? I, I'm not really sure exactly where to pinpoint it. I know that in Quebec there's a history with, with religion and how it had too much influence over mm -hmm. society. So there's a lot of resistance to that and there was the revolution effectively that said we're not going to have a continued society that is so influenced by by the church. Do you think that that extends to religious symbols though? I think so. I think I mean, a lot of folks say that their, their discomfort with religious symbols comes from that history. I think that we can go beyond that. You have been vocal about your criticism of Bill 21, mm -hmm. but you will not go so far as to say that your party, if, they, if you form government, would legally intervene. Is it disingenuous to say that you're opposed to that bill and that you'll protect those minority rights, but you won't go so far as to do it in the courts? Uh, I think it's genuine to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a bearded turban man that's going to Quebec and saying I love the French language, I respect the unique identity of Quebec and I want to fight to defend it and I'm proud of who I am. And I'm hoping that that has a powerful impact on Quebecers. They'll see me as someone who's coming in to say I love and support what this place is about. I take your point, but what do you, why hesitate to go, the, go, go as far as you, as you could and say that this is something I'm so passionate about, I'm willing to intervene? I believe in the things passionately that Quebecers believe in. I believe in women's rights. I believe in uh, the LGBTQ community's rights. I believe in building a society where no one's left behind. All the things that Quebecers believe in. And maybe they can start to say, well, you know, the guy believes in the things that I believe in. Maybe yeah, the symbols I, aren't a problem. I think that makes sense to, to a lot of people listening. I think that will. But I think there's also a question about, and, and this is not just for you, but for mm -hmm. every leader. Is that a political, are you essentially making a political calculation? Are you trading off 
the degree to which you could protect those minority rights for votes in Quebec, because you're worried about those numbers that I just detailed. Well, well, I understand there is, I understand the jurisdiction, and I understand that there is a, a legitimate jurisdictional question here that's a, that's a legal question about jurisdiction and what provinces can or can't do. You also unveiled your platform uh, that was directed towards mm -hmm. Quebec, and uh, as someone who has worked in Alberta, one thing stuck out to me, and, and correct me if my interpretation is, in, is wrong, mm -hmm. but the idea that Quebec would essentially have a veto over any major infrastructure project that went through its borders. What message do you think that sends people in Alberta? Well, well I want to send the message that while Quebec is unique, and I'm proud of that, that's something that we've always believed, and it deserves a unique position, uh, I would not impose a project on any province. And that means there has to be social acceptability. There has to be communities that are on side, that provinces are on side. And that's any province, not just Quebec? It should be. I mean, it should be the fact that if we want to move forward with a project, there has to be the buy-in from all the people involved. Indigenous communities have to be on side. And it's hard work, but we know that if you don't do that work, the project's not going to go ahead anyways. What if you're not able to build that consensus? I mean, are you diminishing... Projects won't go forward. But are you diminishing the power of the federal... Should the federal government not be able to deem what it believes is in the national interest? I think the national interest has to coincide with making the efforts to have people that are impacted believe in the project. And that's hard work, but that's kind of the beauty of federalism. That it's not something that should be where we're imposing decisions, where we work and provide an advantage, provide investments, show people that this is going to be to their benefit. And if that could be done, then it should be a project that goes ahead. So would that apply? And I just want to make sure I'm clear. So if any, pro any big national infrastructure project, if there's one province who didn't want it to go through its borders, it would not go ahead? We wouldn't, imp I think the simplest way to put it is we would not impose projects on provinces. And that veto that you talk about with Quebec would apply to every province? The way we frame it is, it's very important. It's, it's not imposing projects and it's respecting provinces. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm clear because you're not necessarily directly answering my question. I just want to, I don't want to frame this no, wrong I'm, after, I'm, after I'm the interview, I'm giving you the frame, right? you can just accept so my you, frame. Well, <laughs> I wish it's not that easy. I just <laughs> want to make sure because BC has opposition to certain projects as well, yes. right? So if BC was not on board, you would not impose anything. I'm not exactly, yeah. Okay, yes. let me move on because I want to ask you about foreign policy as well. Let's talk about what's happening in China. There are two Canadians who have been detained. We see mm -hmm. massive a massive impact because of China's actions on a number of our export mm. industries like canola, pork, and beef. What would you do differently than the current prime minister, now liberal leader, I guess, during the campaign mm. with China? So I think there's been a, a number of things that were, were unclear. Um, we didn't have an ambassador for a long time. I think that was a problem, a bad decision. Uh, we need to have consistency. We need to be strong. I also watched an interview with you, I think it was with the Financial Post, where they, you were talking a bit about trade. It was a while ago when the tensions with Donald Trump were kind of at, at the height. And you talked about the need for new markets and less reliance on the United States. What do you do with China in that respect? And what other markets would you be looking to grow Canadian exports to? Well, when we grow our, our markets, one of the priori priorities for me is ensuring that we've got a fair trade as opposed to free trade. And the reason why I say that is Free trade has seemed to benefit the wealthiest and the, and the most powerful, but it doesn't seem to benefit working people. And so what I want to make sure is that when we sign agreements and expand our markets, that we're competing with a level playing field. Our Canadian workers are amongst the best in the world, and they can compete with anyone, but they can compete only if the labor rights are similar, environmental rights are similar, and if those aren't, it puts our workers at a disadvantage. Could, they, uh, could that ever be possible with China? I think it would be very difficult. Where do you look then, if you can't look to China? What well, there's kinds a whole of world. <laughs> but, got, what, yeah. but I mean, the, to, to be fair, so much of our, I mean, it, the bigger the market, we've already got CETA, uh, TPP, there are a lot of markets that have been opened up. What more can you do to diversify the, ex, the destination for exports in this country? Well, Where would you be going? Well, there's, I mean, with, with those agreements, we need to expand more in those areas. So just because we have an agreement, we have to build uh, bigger, better ties. <laughs> After uh, the Liberals a few weeks ago unearthed this 2005 video of Andrew Scheer talking about his opposition to same-sex marriage, you came out with a very strongly worded statement. Mm -hmm. I just want to read it. This is exactly why if Canadians deliver a minority government in October, I will not prop up Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives. We can't trust Mr. Scheer or his caucus to champion the fundamental rights of Canadians. People interpreted that in two ways. They first saw that statement and understood what you were saying, but in the second, in the, in the same vein, they interpreted it as you saying you're not going to form government. Do you regret 
making that statement? No, not at all. Uh, I'm very confident in our team and the fact that we're running to form government. I'm running as prime minister. I'm confident about that. Why would you uh, say you wouldn't prop up a government? So I can't uh, dis determine the outcome. And given his comments and given where he stands and given that Canadians are going to choose a government and whatever they choose, I wanted it to be clear that if folks are, are wondering whatever outcome may come, where I stand with respect to those comments being made, I want it to be absolutely clear that for me, uh, a woman's right to choose, same-sex marriage, the rights of people is not negotiable for me. And, and that's why I wanted to make my position clear. Do you think Mr. Scheer is homophobic? I think that he's got a lot of questions to answer. And the fact that he didn't show up to a lot of uh, the pride celebrations that all leaders showed up to, uh, the fact that he's made comments like the ones that you pointed out in the past, He's shown a, a consistent pattern of behavior that really raises a lot of questions, not just on that front, but on a woman's right to choose, on, on his position around building a unified Canada versus trying to divide and create wedges. There is a pattern of behavior that can't be ignored now. He says that he believes in the equality of everyone, that he would never roll back any rights. He points to the fact that he stood up in the House of Commons on behalf of the Conservative Party to support the apology to LGBT people in the public service who had uh, unceremoniously been fired just because of their sexuality. Why isn't that enough for you? I look at that and then I look at the whole other pattern of behaviour. So on one hand he stood up, but on the other hand he's had a whole series of events repeatedly showing something to the contrary. And that just raises a lot of questions. So do you have questions or do you think he's homophobic? It raises a lot of questions and it's to the point where I made it clear because I'm not sure where he stands and because his position has not been clear enough for me and for a lot of Canadians, I'm, I'm confident in saying that I cannot support someone who doesn't think that these rights are just fundamental. The counterfactual that people drew was that you would support a liberal minority. Is that true? Well, I would be willing to take anyone's support who wants to work with me to put in place things like proportional representation or take anyone's support who would like to put in place things like farming care for all or expanding our housing to truly invest in building half a million new affordable homes. Do you have a red line? Elizabeth May talked about, you know, the if she were to support any for any any party forming a minority government, it would be they would have to commit to the climate targets that she set up. That's her that's her baseline. Do you have one? Uh, it's something, one of those things that we're going to have to, we'll see when we get there, we'll make negotiations and decisions. I mean, right now, I want to be very clear, I'm running to form government and I'm really confident. But you haven't, you have ruled out, and I know this is a hypothetical, and I yeah. take your point that, yeah. of course, you are yeah. running to form government, but you have not ruled out, um, you have ruled out supporting a conservative minority, you have not ruled out anything else. I've not ruled out anything else. Okay. But I'm running for prime minister. My final question is this. I, I've been thinking a lot, and I know that there's a, a concern in the NDP around how the media has framed your party in this election, and I, and I take your point on that. I think often of the, I guess, the way in which your party has been talked about for, for the months in the lead up and yourself, your own leadership, pointing to fundraising numbers and polling numbers. And I try to put myself in your shoes and I think, what, what if my ratings were terrible every night and people were talking about it all the time and I knew I was wearing it and my colleagues were jumping ship. I find it hard on bad days to motivate myself already. Like, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, if I can be really honest, I've been through way worse in my life. I really focus about how hard things are for people. And for me, that's easy to do because this isn't like my own worries are nothing compared to what people are going through. And why I'm fighting for a better future is because I remember what it was like when I couldn't find housing when I was in university and my parents we lost our home. I remember what it's like when my dad was struggling to find a place for rehab and he, we didn't have private insurance. We didn't have any other way. We needed publicly funded spots and luckily we were able to find a spot. I know what it's like to not have help when you need it and to get that help made the world a difference for me and I want to make sure that no one is left behind, that people can get the care that they need. Your biggest political gaffe? Oh, um, what would it be? Well, I mean, I didn't think it was a big deal, but now I guess it's a big deal. When I turned back to ask in a scrum, when I chatted with, uh, Mr. Caron. with Monsieur Caron, um, I thought it was cute but people did not take it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your political hero? Political hero. I think my hero in general is like my mom and dad. And I think about, like I'm only here because of them, my dad because of his resilience and how he, how he went through an incredible transformation, went through some really difficult, horrible parts of his life. And now is like this amazing uh, spiritual and healthy and strong person. And my mom, 
who was resilient through it all. Um, those are really my, my heroes. My mom taught me, she doesn't really fit the definition of a political hero, but she is a hero because my politics all come from her. The fact that she taught me that we're all one and that we're all connected and we've got to fight for each other. That was our next question, personal hero. Oh. Do you have a political role model? Mm. Politically, I guess, I mean, I love what, what Tommy Douglas did uh, as a new Democrat. I think a lot of us think of how much he overcame to bring in something that at the time was considered radical. I guess we can just look to the states and see how radical the concept of having health care for everyone. It's being argued and fought against and there's all sorts of money being thrown against it. And we built it here and it was really his vision with a lot of support from Canadians that built something beautiful and that's pretty inspirational. Okay, finish this sentence. Yeah. Elizabeth May is? A leader of the Green Party. <laughs> if you could pick one job, and I know you've already, you're a lawyer obviously, but if you could pick one job outside of politics, what would it be? Ooh, uh, at one point in my life, I was really seriously choosing between being a lawyer and uh, trying, trying to become a, a, a professional a mixed martial artist. It was something I was really passionate about. And I, I didn't go that route because of my family struggles, but it's kind of a thing in the back of your head. You always wonder, you know, how good could I have been? I was a pretty good competitor, uh, amateur, but it would have been cool to, to try that out. I did not know that. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh. <laughs> really so appreciate, appreciate it. it. Enjoy the rest of your day and good Thank luck you. in the campaign. Thank you. I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.